Okay, I'm hitting live on YouTube. All quiet okay, on the set. Great. Here we Thanks. go. And now it's going to be, I'll let you know when we're live, live. All right, I'm going to open the doors. Doors are open. Welcome, friends. We'll get started just momentarily. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for being here. Welcome, YouTube friends. Thank you for being here. And happy Mardi Gras. Yay. This is where the party's at right now, tonight. All right, letting folks in, welcome. All right, it is now 7 p.m. Cheryl, do you think I could get you to keep an eye on let folks in the admit while I do the intro? All right, welcome everybody. Tonight you are in for a special treat. This is part of our more than a month celebration, which is uh, SFPL's version of Black History Month, running from January throughout February. And tonight we have Cheryl Derricote and Ramakan Oristers. And they're gonna be talking in conversation about uh, Black folk art and Black art and their influences in art and share some art with them, share some art with us, I should say. So just some quick library updates and other information to share with you about what's happening. Uh, we want to welcome you to the unceded land of the Ohlone tribal people and acknowledge the many Ramutish Ohlone tribal groups and families as the rightful stewards of the lands in which we live and reside and work here in the Bay Area. Uh, SFPL is committed to uplifting the names of these lands and community members from these nations with whom we live. We encourage you to learn more about first person culture and land rights and are committed to hosting events and providing factual and useful information, which the library does so well. We also want to acknowledge that SFPL is not a neutral institution and stands in solidarity with Black Lives Matter movement and ending our own uh, systemic and structural institutional racism within the library, within our city, um, something that uh, ha we've been working on really hard. Our racial equity committee recently has um, a new commitment plan and you can find that on our website. I will also, you can see I shared a, a link to a document. We'll have all of those resources about Black Lives Matter and indigenous culture. And I'll put the link for the racial equity commitment. It will also have lots of information about Cheryl and Ramakan and other uh, great things we have happening at the library. Um, we do have our library to go and you can place all your materials on hold. And a reminder when you go to that library to pick up your colds and all your materials and anywhere you're going, grocery stores, food, all of it, please mask up. We are still you know, trying to keep safe, trying to keep healthy. Um, this beautiful art is by Samuel Rodriguez and you can find him on Instagram. We are celebrating Women's History Month and we are partnering with the McCovey, McAvoy Foundation for the Arts and part of Isaac Julian's ongoing um, exhibition about Frederick Douglass. If you have not seen it, it is ending in March, free by appointment. You can go see it, screens, multi, um, multimedia exhibition. Um, he's gonna be in, part, in conversation with none other than Judith Butler. So that is, 
just mind blowing. The um, she's a if you don't know, she's a, a gender scholar and just amazing work. And also with Celeste Marie Bernier, who is a Frederick Douglass scholar. So it's going to be a really um, well worthy conversation. And I worry about those mar those noontime events. So please come out for the event and show some support on this one. Uh, we booked the Gorilla Girls, which I'm so excited about. And this is part of our One City, One Book campaign, which we are celebrating Chanel Miller. And we book a lot of events around the One City, One Book campaign. So come out through March and April to celebrate Women's History Month, as well as Sexual Violence Awareness Month, which is what Chanel Miller's book is about. Uh, we will be, we're celebrating Namwali Serpel, and I just finished this book last night. Very interesting and a long span of history, but also with a weird twist of science fiction. So really interesting book, book club on Monday. Please purchase your books from our local bookstores. Uh, we are supporting and celebrating Marcus Books, the nation's oldest black independent bookstore, as well as Borderland Books these two months. And I mentioned it's more than a month. We still have a lot of events, both for adults and all ages, multi-generational. Our famous Effie Lee Morris lecture coming up with, why doesn't it say his name? <laughs> Jason Reynolds, everybody. And so he'll be, be talking about the transformativeness of reading and writing and, you know, towards youth. Tomorrow night, Melissa Valentine, who is Oakland native, now living in New York, will be in conversation with Amber Butts. Her book is so wonderful and um, talking about grief. She lost her brother, it's a memoir. Uh, grief, police violence, but also it just is so relatable and um, family, family dynamic. So come to that tomorrow night. And we have a partnership with Moed on Friday. I have loved our art partnerships with uh, Moad. Such a wonderful afternoon just to spend some time doing art. And we're gonna be doing mail art workshop on Friday. So come check that out and some more history. And now without further ado, tonight's event, Cheryl Derricote and Remican Oristers. Um, and I'm just gonna give a quick bio to the two of them. Um, first up, Cheryl Derricote is a visual artist. Her favorite mediums are glass and paper. Her recent awards include being named one of the 2020 YBC, YBCA 100, woohoo, and Villa San Francisco's French Consulate Micro Residency, the Windgate Craft Fellowship at Vermont Studio Center Residency, and the Athena Paper Machine Residency in New Orleans. She is an active leader in the arts and serves as the Chief Mindfulness Officer of Crux, a nationwide cooperative of Black artists working at the intersection of art and technology through immersive storytelling. Cheryl is represented by Re Riddle Gallery in San Francisco. Ramakan, growing up in Jim Crow South during the Civil War, Civil, Civil, War, Civil Rights Movement, Ramakan has had a safe haven quilting with his grandmother where he embraced important, where he was embraced important and special. He continued to paint and draw throughout high school, college, graduate school, and while living in Tokyo from 1986 to 1991. Currently, he weaves textiles around large broken ceramics as stand-ins for his feelings of anxiety, fear, anger, and despair associated with the permanence of racism, white body supremacy, and homophobia. Also, Ramakan is the founder of Crochet Jam, a nine-year-old community arts project infused with the Black folk art tradition that fo fosters a creative culture and cooperative relationships, relax relaxation, and liberation. And both Cheryl and Ramakan are associated with a 3.9 uh, art collective here in San Francisco, and I'm gonna put those links into the chat box and anything else that comes up tonight that Ramakan and Cheryl talk about, I will link those back to wherever I possibly can, hopefully SFPL. 
And we will have time for questions and answers. So get those questions ready and that will be towards the end. And now without further ado, I'm turning it over to Cheryl and Ramakon. Thank you, Anissa, for that generous introduction. Thank you, San Francisco Public Library for hosting us. And hello, Ramakan. Hello there. How are yeah, you? I, I want to ditto all that too. So thank you everyone for being here and for the, and for the um, library hosting us. It's great. So shall we jump right in, Cheryl? Let us jump in, take okay. it away. Okay, so I, so, you know, how about, you know, talking about some of your early influences, you know, uh, folk art influences on, on your work, you know, your family or friends or others. So let, let's just, let's just start right there. We'll, we'll open it, open it right there. How about that? That's great. So I came from not a big family, but an extended family. I had great grandparents into my twenties. Um, so on my mother's side of the family, my great grandmother lived to be a hundred. And on my father's side, my great grandmother lived to be 90. So I, you know, was always with them. I would say my first craft was cast iron cooking. I also learned how to sew. I learned how to crochet from my grandmother on my father's side. I know we share a love of crochet and that's something I learned from her. And so work with the hand, um, was really important in our family. Um, and some of it, you know, was necessity. I mean, I had a single mother. And so growing up, my mother did make a lot of our clothes. Um, it was the 70s. So it was really fun to have matching dashikis in the, you know, the Black Power days. And she would make those for us. Um, so there was constantly a culture in my family of the hand and working with the hand. Uh, we share that. You're right. You know, because um, you know, and it's all matrilineal because my my mother, my grandmother, you know, they all were uh, working with uh, fabric. My mother worked as a as a piecemeal worker in a factory in a cotton factory called Haynes Haynes Knit. Mm. It was in, when it was in North Carolina, mm -hmm. and so she taught me how to how to sew by hand and how to uh, use a sewing machine. Mm -hmm. You know, which I'm sure uh, caught the caught the attention of the other men and young young men in my family because I was the only one that she taught how to do that. And, and as we mentioned before, my grandmother taught me how to how to uh, quilt. Mm -hmm. You know, so you so you know, um, and the whole idea of of the of their influences on me. I think the biggest influence has been their creativity because they, you know, no one in my family used oil paint or on canvas or acrylic on canvas, none of those traditional materials, they use, they express their emotions and feelings and pain and anguish through fabric, mm -hmm. through sewing, you know, which I thought, you know, in modern terms, that isn't what we would, people would usually assume that would be something that would be valued. Mm -hmm. But, you know, but, I, but I, in our, you know, in, in the black folk art tradition, those things are valued, mm -hmm. you know, and the stories are told either visually you know, and some may even, may even you know, in, embroider or, or uh, their, their stories into the quilts or, uh, or other materials. Mm -hmm. But I never thought it was important until I, until I decided, you know, like, you know, um, how much time am I going to spend on trying to get into a fine art tradition when that isn't my background? It isn't how I, my worldview, right? Mm -hmm. You know, how do we, how do we um, accept our own experience outside of the dominant culture or the field that we're in that that negates or isn't or doesn't appreciate that uh, experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I totally resonate with that, you know, because I think as a person who makes political art and you also make political art, I think it's been really important to retain that voice through yes. my art making, you yes. know, and that is not always a voice that's welcomed in the mainstream art world. I think right. it's more welcomed right now than it has been in a while. And there's certainly examples of, you know, wonderful black artists that have crossed into the stratosphere, whether it's, you know, somebody like a Theaster Gates or, you know, Dred Scott, yes. but it's not the norm, so to speak, of what right. one would associate with fine art. 
Well, you know, and I think that's interesting because now craft and fine art, those, those categories among people who are really, you know, open their minds to the idea are, are no longer, um, they're no longer valid in a way, you know, yeah. That they're not, yeah, they're, 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 you know, they're not, they're being the, uh, l less uh, valued as a way of describing the importance of craft um, and, and its role uh, throughout history, you know, and, and particularly when it comes to fine art. So did we forget to do the images? Well, you jumped in. We can still <laughs> do some images. No, I mean, this is, okay, we are, <laughs> we're, we're doing no. okay. <laughs> so, so you wanna go, you wanna, okay. how about you wanna go first? You wanna, you wanna show your images? Okay, all right. All right. I will show some images. Okay, here we go. Let me try and share screen. Everybody, okay. you know we're on Zoom. And look, I'm seeing the names. It's so much fun. Thank you, New York City and DC home people for yes, staying up you. for me. And hello, San Francisco friends. I see you. All right, let me share the screen. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to start with an old piece. This was actually like the first sculpture I made back in 2002 at the Washington Glass School, which is where I first learned glass. And, you know, this piece, it was so interesting because I just was at a place in my life where I was kind of tired of talking to people about homelessness, which was the line of work I was in. They really were not getting it anymore. And I just sort of said, hmm, maybe if I make a sculpture about all of this, that's a different way for people to engage. And so I made this piece in like the second workshop I took at Washington Glass Studio. And unbeknownst to me, there was a Washington Post reporter embedded in the class to cover this new glass school. So she immediately was like following me around and Erwin, one of the two own, three owners now, Erwin, Tim, and Michael, who own the glass studio. She was following me and Erwin around. And she wrote about this piece. And I was like, wow. And then, you know, to the spirit of artists not waiting for opportunities, we used to hang our own shows wherever we could find space in DC. So we did a show in DC in an old school that had been converted to an art center. And the Washington Post art critic at that time wrote about my piece. And at that moment, um, Tim, Tim Tate, who's one of the co-owners of Washington Glass said, you know, kind of funny you in the Washington Post twice, first time out. I think you might have a future and you might want to settle down. And I had not thought about Glass. I hadn't thought really about a visual arts career. It was something I was doing, you know, to let off the steam of anti-poverty work. And he very smartly said, I want you to go to this place that I learned how to blow glass. And I want you to go right away because there's a class being taught by a man named Thurman Statham, who is the most famous black glass artist on the planet. And I want you to see somebody that looks like you right away that's having a go at it. So, Very good. Yeah. So that's what's going on with that piece. And, you know, we can talk about later. It's a little rough. And then let me go. So now I'm just going to jump and show some work on my website. This is more recent glass that I've made in the past few years. Um, this is actually screen print with enamel on glass showing um, slaves and former slaves. And in the case of the children, those are actually um, an image of grandchildren of slaves. And so people can sort of see how my glass work has grown over the years. And I also make work on paper, which we'll talk about since I am in the home studio in the kitchen. So works like these digital collages and G clay prints, um, and, and we can also talk about Tom later because that's a whole nother thing. But um, yeah, so this is the kind of work that through the pandemic, I've really been making a lot more of work on paper. And then the last image I am gonna show you is actually some work that's up now. This is 
public art. This is a billboard that's in Los Angeles right now at Hollywood Boulevard and Wilcox Avenues as part of a show called Whistling in the Dark. Um, Save Art Space is a nonprofit that does calls for artists, um, curated shows, and all of the work goes on billboards. And so they have right now this show in LA, New York, and Philadelphia. And I know it's kind of hard to read the red text. So the text says 6.7 million Black people live in the 91 U.S. counties with an oil refinery. And the image is one of my photographs of Richmond. Um, and I know a lot of San Francisco folks, Bay Area folks, know the Richmond Chevron refinery very well. Um, for those who don't, literally, I just walked down the street to the fence there and took that picture, um, which is the whole point of people living on the fence line. And so the quote is drawn from an NAACP and Clean Air Task Force report in 2017. So, you know, I am going to stop there. And, you know, I think people understand that the work has always been political. Fantastic. Thank you. You know, Thank you for that, Cheryl. So I'm going to reciprocate and show a few of my um, images. Uh, these are, there we go. Great. Um, these are images on um, my gallery website, which is Frito Gallery. And what you see here is um, there's the ceramics and fabric. So the idea is, you know, and I'm, I'm, very, I'm very grateful uh, for the ceramics that come from teachers and professors and students at the uh, California State University, Long Beach, mm -hmm. where they donated their shards. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and the whole, and the whole idea of, of using shards and um, fabric uh, remnants you know, usually, usually shards are thrown away and discarded and, and remnants are usually, you know, there usually isn't enough to make uh, a garment or whatever. And, and they too may be thrown away and, and discarded. Mm -hmm. so, I, so I just, you know, moving away from the idea of, of um, using traditional materials to tell my story, I decided to use, you know, objects that were discarded mm -hmm. and that are thrown away. And all this has come about through my residency at the at Recology mm -hmm. Art residency program in twenty in twenty sixteen after I after I graduated from my full time job. Yeah. But but the but the idea is to you know that um, that ceramics are a stand in, and this is the whole uh, beginning of a new series, a current series called Cheesecake. There, you know, and so for me, the, the idea is to create work that that, um, you know, cheesecake number 13 is about, you know, the idea is to create work that no one has seen before. Like how do you create something that no one has seen? Mm -hmm. You know, and the idea of using materials that are discarded because we don't, you know, we don't respect them, um, you know, in, in a way to, that they can be uh, seen as something viable, something positive, you know, to create something positive that can um, have, a, have a profound impact on, on a positive impact on, one, on, one's, on other people and your own creativity. Mm -hmm. So here's just a range of, of how those um, mm. uh, pieces can be, you know, you know, can be imagined. So um, I don't start with a plan. I mean, I, I, I let the material just, you know, transform in front of me and I just make sure that I wear gloves and that uh, I don't get too excited because shards, they are sharp and dangerous. And sometimes they can be, well, they're shards, they can be sharp and they, they're unforgiving. So um, now I'm able to, to, to use the gloves um, so that I can get even closer to the ceramics so that they, they, they take on a shape and a, a, um, of their own. You know, that I don't have to, I don't have to try to force them into anything, you know, like I just, I, I go with my, with my, um, I, I trust my creativity. I just trust, I, I feel as though that there's very little in life that I can trust, to be honest. 
Mm-hmm. And as you know, as you know, uh, as an artist, we have to trust our 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 creativity. You know, and everything else seems to be, you know, uh, on the on the edge, on the edge, as it were. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> as it were. So these are, you know, you can see more images, you know, at, you know, at, at, on the gallery website, which is the Street Soul Gallery. Mm-hmm. But I just wanted to give people a, a general idea of the current work and how and how I take folk art traditions because you know they're these are they're adding quilting, sewing, um, crocheting, obviously, and I just don't I don't I don't worry about what's going to happen. I just let it happen, mm-hmm. right? So I'm going to uh, stop there, and then we can and you and I can continue. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing, Ramakot. Well, and I got to say, cheers on, you know, the graduation back there in 2016 from (laughs) the full-time job, because I always say hashtag real artists have day jobs. So I am glad you are free to make more of that beautiful work. Well, yes. I mean, that yes, it is a luxury to have the time. But even, you know, even when I had a full-time job, I still made the work. I still found ways to, to make you know, because I don't think I would be where I am now if I did not have the continuity of the practice, which I'm sure you would, you know, the continuity of the practice is very important. It is, you know, I think you've hit on a key thing there because even though the pandemic has been really difficult and I haven't, you know, been in my studio with glass as much through the pandemic, you know, to figure out ways to make work on paper that still has the point of view and people know that's my work. You know, I think is like, in some ways artists were built for this moment. You know, we constantly shift and adapt and see what is needed in every moment. Well, you know, um, the idea of being able to be that conscious because we usually want to like, you know, uh, you know, working with art, that working with materials that that aren't usually seen, and you know, in in the art in the art market or whatever, um, to, to be able to stay focused, knowing that well, it, it may not be seen now, it may not be seen later, but it still doesn't matter. What, what what's more important is that you stay focused uh, on 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 for for me, the idea is staying focused on taking something out of one context and putting it in another context for an, an entirely different purpose. Mm-hmm. You know, the whole idea of taking ceramics, broken ceramics and fabric remnants out of one context and crochet and quilting and sewing out of, the, out of a domestic, you know, and then putting it in another context, you know, the idea of sculpture and, you know, and also the idea of in crochet jam, the idea of a public art event. And then mm-hmm. for another purpose, the whole idea of, uh, of uh, sculpture or in a fine art context, uh, as in as in uh, a gallery or museum. Mm-hmm. No, I mean you definitely. There's so much about the work that I love. I mean, first off, it's clearly environmental. You know, yeah. to to use the materials that are discarded. I mean, is a great service to the environment, and I love that you've developed a partnership as well with you know, a California college that, yes, you, know, is, yes. you know, that's wonderful. Yes. Through, uh, through the students there at uh, um, California State University, Long Beach, and with uh, Tony Marsh, you know, phenomenal work, and, and, and uh, Chris, Christopher, Chris Miles as well, mm-hmm. uh, phenomenal work. And the, and the idea that, you know, that um, of looking at, you know, looking in, different categories like I, you know I don't pretend to be a uh, a ceramic artist I'm not a ceramic artist mm. like, mm-hmm. I don't know I know I know folk traditions about weaving but I but I, I don't have the skills of weaving on a on a loom right right, right? right. so right. so I I'm not pretending to be any of those things I'm just I'm just mm-hmm. bringing these pieces together and people around me you know uh mm-hmm the fabric whatever they they celebrate these things out of different fields yes you know and so you know and you know and and in the and in the black tradition the whole idea of improvising you know well well you know i'm not you know i'm i'm not a painter i'm not (laughs) Mm -hmm. right so what do i where do i find my voice you know where do you find your voice where do you find your voice cheryl you know 
text is important. And that's something I wanted to circle back with you about. You know, a lot of times my work has a title before I make the work. I, uh-huh. I am very driven by text. Um, yeah, I, I call it the tyranny of title. I mean, like a phrase will get stuck with me and I will write the phrase down in the journal and at some point come back to it when the time is right um, because it's just been there, you know, and I just have to make something about it. You know, it's like, there's a lot, I would say that's intuitive to some degree in that sense. When you, when you talk about trusting the process and not having a plan, you know, I feel like that's what's happening when I get the phrase or the initial concept. It's like, okay, I'm gonna build the right work to go along with what I'm hearing. So where do you find those? Where do they just do they do they wake you up in the in the you know in the middle of the night? <laughs> do, do you see them and the, where do you find this? Yeah, this you know, it's funny. Sometimes, sometimes, yes. I mean, I I always say the news is like a wonderful place for me. Like I can be reading the newspaper and a turn of phrase will strike me, or you know, something about a contemporary event will strike me and that might be a phrase that I jot down. Um, I know, because you graciously came to my show, when I had my first solo show at Moed, one of the pieces was a woman, hands up, don't shoot. And so we were hearing that phrase so much in the news that when I was contemplating the work, you know, I had jotted down, hands up, don't shoot. And then in looking at the historical images, I saw all of these images of black people in fiction with their hands up in this position, you know? So that that's just one example of like a phrase from the contemporary lexicon that gets stuck in my head. There was a point, um, And I still, you know, I keep them until I think that's the part about, you know, the freedom that comes when you graduate from the day job is that sometimes I go back to work that I may have started years before because I don't feel like it's been brought fully to fruition or a show. So I was making some work um, a few years ago along the theme of we buy houses. And so I was seeing all those signs. I was living in Oakland when I first moved here 10 years ago and we buy houses, we buy houses everywhere, you know, jotted it down. One day I literally came out the front door of my apartment. There was a van parked in front of the apartment and the whole back bumper had a sign. We buy houses with the number. I was like, all right, universe, I'm going to settle down in the studio when I get there. We buy houses. So... Yeah, but I, I also liked the you know the story behind the piece that you made for the for the the the, the, the young exhibition. Mm-hmm. Yeah, tell us you know, talk about that. That's I like that story. Tell us about. That. Okay, I will. So um, I had been again with the news. I had been following the two different newspaper accounts that were keeping track of people killed by the police. Um, the Guardian UK had a project called The Counted, and they were keeping track of people killed by the police in the US. And the Washington Post also had a project called Fatal Force. And so um, I started really diving into those numbers. I had the opportunity to go away for a one week residency in 2016. And I really started diving into those numbers while I was um, in Maine at this place, the Garderev Center. And I had a big calendar and I started hand stamping bullets on the calendar because I was beginning to see it wasn't just one person that would get killed on any given day. It might be multiple people in multiple states and we really weren't processing that. And so the piece that I made, you know, a couple of years later again, um, which was shown in the De Young this past fall in their show was called 2017 Year at a Glance, 214 Dead Black Men. And I hand stamped a bullet for each day that a black man had been killed in the US. And 
one of you know my great joys about that work is that, as we said earlier, when things come at the right time, it was the right time for people to have a bigger conversation about police brutality in America. And so the de Young really embraced that piece. And we talked about it a lot when newspaper articles came up. Um, and then ultimately they acquired the piece for their permanent collection this winter. You know, that's, that's tremendous. You know, and what's, what, what, um, what it brings to mind is the whole idea of how uh, black, black folk art and black art uh, and black tradition can be subversive. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So your piece speaks to that, to know, to, you know, what, you know, what role does it have, you know, in, in subverting the narrative? Mm -hmm. you know, you know, um, for me, the idea of like, you know, of, of, of taking something that already has, you know, um, you know, uh, just, you know, just thrown away, discarded, whatever. Mm -hmm. you know, and putting it in a different context or revering it, right, is a way of, you know, the way of subverting because the idea of fabric and ceramics, broken ceramics, anything that isn't within the, the, the um, traditional fine art tradition, mm -hmm. you know, and after a while, you know, we don't, you know, that, that tradition may not value our experience, right? So it's, instead of having to say, well, instead of having to fight to get into that that um, uh, rarefied uh, field, another way of looking at it is: we you know what? I'm just going to take. I'm just going to be authentic to my tradition, mm -hmm. and you right, and let that carry the day. You know. So yes, you know. Uh, I I feel connected to. If I feel broken, thrown away, whatever. How can I make that beautiful? I mean, just seductively beautiful. Yeah. And um, and and with you know and you know and and with the fabric and the shards, you know, whole idea of of, of danger and allure, mm -hmm. uh, sensation and um, uh, you know and relaxation. The whole idea of like these um, this yin and yang of back and forth mm -hmm. um, for me is very exciting, and it's also outside of the of of a of a of a, of a tradition that. Um, isn't isn't look isn't valuing art in that way, mm -hmm. you know? And the same is true of the piece that you know that that isn't usually what people would see in a museum. The, the work that the piece that you made for the Dion, right? Yeah. So so I feel in some ways you may you may have your I would like to hear your point of view on it. Is that uh, at least currently museums museums and galleries are looking at artwork of of black from black artists in ways that they may not have before. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think that is part of, you know, I say we've been in twin pandemics right now. We've been in COVID-19 and we've been in racism, you know, we could call it V5. I mean, it's like version six, whatever, you know, twin pandemics of COVID and racism. And I think that because the two came together with shelter in place, it's a moment where the museum space, the gallery space <laughs> wants to be involved in this contemporary dialogue that is very much a movement dialogue, okay? It's a movement dialogue that Black Lives Matter is having and it's not lost on us that it's a movement run by queer Black women, all of whom are authors one of whom is a performance artist, you know, so there's already this built in relationship of movement and art that has always existed in the black community. And now museum is catching up. Yes. Yes. Um, you know, um, um, you know, that, you know, hopefully that and, and they will stay catched up. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's you know, what we hope. Just that, you know, hope. Yeah. yeah, we don't know, but we know we would we would hope that that is that that is the future. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, you know, and 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 the idea that you know black art and black traditions. You know, I feel as though if we don't tell our story, either as as artists, um, whether we're writers, uh, performance artists, or visual artists, or glass art, whatever we are, if we don't tell our story, um, other people will. 
and it won't be the story we want to be heard that we want to that we want to hear. That's right. Yeah. No, yeah. it's very important. It is very important. You know, representation still matters, and I think that's what is interesting to me um, about the work that Anissa mentioned in the introduction. If people have not seen the Isaac Julian work about Frederick Douglass, um, it's stunning. And it's so important because you see in Douglas's time through that work, how much Douglas understood that representation mattered and yes. his embrace of the daguerreotype as a way to be a messenger of the abolitionist movement was incredible, yes. you know? Yes, he was subverting the, you know, because he was, you know, the, before then the, the culture was, was showing these racist images of black people. That's right. And once black people got their hands on uh, a means of photography, uh, photographing themselves, you know, they were able to, to put into the world images of themselves that were, uh, you know, elegant, sophisticated, yes. you know, that, that was undermining all the negative images that the dominant culture was spewing out over the, you know, Yes, and that was, and that too was, a, that too was subversive. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, subversive. you know, and it continued, you know, from the Gutera type all the way, you know, I think about Vanderzee, who had yeah. such a long and storied photographic career in New York and the way, you know, he took everyday life and captured everyday life when people came to sit for him, you know, in DC, um, it was Scurlock who was the black photographer that captured everyday life, you know? So I have photos from my grandparents and great grandparents where they sat for Scurlock. Yes. You know, because it was yes. important to show yourself. Yes. You know, here, there's a, there's a, there's a, uh, I mean, he's in his nineties now, uh, David, David Johnson, you heard of him? I have, I think yeah. I have. You know, I he's, one of, he's one of, he was the only African-American photographer who studied with Ansel Adams? Mm, mm -hmm. You know, and I uh, and I have a photograph of you know that you know my wall here uh, that I got as a graduation present from from the from the museum mm -hmm. that has um, you know a protester still protesting. Okay. You know, and, on, and on the front of it, it says, you know, we demand. Mm -hmm. You know, and and the whole idea of like you know the the continuity of art of black artists and black folk art traditions that have gone through. The whole idea of we're still demanding. Yes. Yes. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, it, it is a continuous cycle. And I think it's important for people to understand that, like, for better or for worse, you don't get a break. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? It's like struggle is something that has to continue until we reach the place of a just society. You know, and I think that unfortunately, because we'll see some progress, then people get comfortable again. And then there's this huge, terrible backlash like we saw in the last four years. And it feels like we've taken two steps forward and three steps back. Yeah, so how do we inspire? How do we inspire, you know, other artists, you know, young artists, you know, of color to, uh, you know, to do their work, you know, how do we, you know, I mean, I think the best way to do that, you know, is just to, for ourselves to do it so they can see us, Absolutely. you, know, you yeah. know, with the good, the bad and the ugly of it. That's you right. Know, like, Cause it's important to us. If it's important to us, we will do it regardless. Yeah, no, and I mean, that's what I think is great about, you know, groups like 3.9, which you are a member of. I just became emeritus after four years. Um, Crux, you know, the organization I'm involved with as um, volunteer mindfulness officer, because it's always important, I think, to bring mindfulness into the space of work, particularly when you're dealing with difficult topics in your work. I think, you know, we can go off on that tangent too, but um, <laughs> we'll get back to, you know, stay with protest and then okay, we'll get back to the mindfulness. But, you know, um, I think it, it, it's to the point of what Tim did for me when he sent me to Penland right away to take class with Thurman. It's like every generation needs to see those in the generation before them and how they made it. You know, one of my favorite stories that Thurman 
told at Penland, and I'm not talking out of school because he tells people this. It was years he did not quit his job at yeah. UPS because that was yeah. a union job. Yes. He was yes. like, I ain't letting a union job yeah. go. I didn't, I didn't either. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, he's like, I didn't let that go until I was really sure, you know, that we were on the path, you know, to like making it full time as an artist, you know. And so I agree with you that it's really important for people to continue to do their work. And I also think, and you've named this, and I just want to, you know, sort of put a period on it and plan your career. Don't plan somebody else's career. Don't plan, you know, what you're hearing should be the career, you know, especially now when the internet has changed the game, okay? It's changed the game completely. So to the extent that people can have a very different online platform, a very different and younger collector base, because that's how they engage with the world, you know, is through Instagram. It's like, don't, don't limit yourself exclusively to one thing or the other. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you got, you got to find creative ways to be visible. I mean, uh, and creative ways to, uh, make your work important, you know, how do we make it important? Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's, that's what we like. So what, you know, what do we do? Like, do we, you know, do we like, you know, um, um, follow a traditional path, you know, like, remember, you know, in the old school, you, you take slides of your work, yes. right. And send them out to everybody. Right. Yeah. And then the problem with that is, well, unless you really know where you're sending them, you, it, it, it's, it's more or less a miss and rarely a hit. That's right. 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 So, it, you know, it's better to, you know, to know all the all the venues around and then and then, you know, understand how they're how they're operating and what ways your work fit in, fits into there if it fits at all. That's right. Right. Yeah. Uh, or create or create your own venue. Like, you know, I think that for me, the whole idea of crochet jam was, mm -hmm. you know, uh, allowing me to like, well, OK, so the galleries aren't paying me any attention. You know, why do I keep going to these places that, that are that are negating my creativity? Why not just figure out, well, what do I what am I really asking from, you know, from these organizations, these curators? And, you know, do I want to be heard? Do I want to be respected? Do I want to have financial you know, means from from my art? Do I want to have a community? You know, so instead of. You know, always taking my hat in my hand to these organizations, why not just give to others what I need? Right. Give to others what I need. So if I want a community, then build one. Mm -hmm. Right. If you want to be heard, then then um, do it in a way that that is positive and creative and allow other people to express themselves and do it in a way that, you know, that's that's um, you know, that's traditionally marginalized folk art traditions. Mm -hmm. Right. So 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 instead of me wanting something from music from these organizations, they, I maybe I have been able to feel a need that you know, and that's how I've been able to you know to stay um, uh, relevant in a way mm -hmm. in a in a social in a um, community art practice. How do you you know how do you how do you make your work important and how do you stay relevant? And yeah. a lot of that now, as you mentioned, can be done you know like online, like we're doing right here. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, I mean, I think you know plus one to everything you said. I mean, anything that begins with service is always a wonderful thing. And, you know, I want you to tell people more about Crochet Jam because not everybody knows what Crochet Jam is. I have been to Crochet Jam and everything about Thank Crochet you. Jam is an art form. I mean, the crochet hooks are made as many sculptures for the hand. Tell people yes. about Crochet Jam. Yes. I mean, Crochet Jam, you know, it's just a way of using, thank you. It's just a way of using, um, a folk art tradition of weaving, you know, crocheting with a wooden hook, uh, you know, and but 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 not focused on a finished product, mm -hmm. so that you can you know you allow the material to inform you about what it wants to become. So it's a whole process of letting go of expectations, you know. So in the event, uh, I have the fabric there, and you can pick out any color, any any strip of fabric that you want. So I'm not dictating the creative process. I'm not telling you what you're making. I'm not saying we're making a rag rug or a scarf or a potholder. If you want to, you, you, you can make one. I'm saying that 
you know, allow the material to become whatever it wants. Mm -hmm. And you're just the conduit for that transformation. And you don't judge it. Whatever happens, these are all your colors. So I want, I want to be in a, in a place where I'm not judged. Mm -hmm. I'm not told what to do. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, um, and there are no expectations, you know, there's no expectations, you know, so I'm really speaking to, you know, I'm, I'm addressing my unconsciousness. Like I, you know, I'm, you know, when I, when I uh, am in these events, I'm not worrying about what they make. I'm not worrying about the fabric. I'm trying to give them a, a few milliseconds if possible, where they don't have to worry about being judged or told what to do. And there's nowhere else you can go. Like where, it's rare, where can one go and not be told what to do? and not be judged. And, since, and from, the, from the womb, we are hardwired to please others and want to be told what to do and want to be judged. So, yes. And we can't be who we are if we're always being told what to do and always being critiqued. Mm -hmm. no, that's but to me, it's the Black American experience. So as Black America, we are always told what to do. Yes. Don't, and we're always being, uh, being judged. So, you know, your hair is too kinky, your hair is too long, your hair is too this, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're talking too loud, you know, you know, you're too, you know, there's always some category or, it, or it, in any, any um, culture where you're marginalized, you know, uh, gay, queer, lesbian, whatever, you know, the whole mm -hmm. transgender is always these um, rules. And in Crochet Jam, you can break the rules. And I like, that's, Breaking the rules. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I love it. No, it's totally fun. And I hope everybody here, you know, when we come through the pandemic, I know you've been doing some online too, but I hope, you know, in a year or so that people will be able to attend one in person because it's just so much fun to hang out with other people and make something together. And, and you know, there is, there's such, as you said, a community feeling about it. It's a way that people who haven't engaged with each other suddenly by working on this piece together are a community in that moment. Which in that is moment, very yes. Powerful. And we, yeah. need that, we need that feeling, particularly now, well, you know, with the pandemic, I don't think that many people feel, since everything is so virtual, yeah. uh, what, is, how you, what is community and how, right. you, and how do we define it? You know, so when you say I speak to the community and I'm, you know, I'm a, you know, or I'm a, a museum or an art center or whatever, you know, reflecting the needs and concerns of the community, mm -hmm. what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think it means a lot of different things depending on which institution, you know, I Fair mean, enough. yeah, and, you know, I'm a real fan. Listen, let me tell people right now, I'll say it to you. I I'm a museum artist. I have been a museum artist my whole career. And that's why I take it like Baldwin. Because I love America so much, I'm going to criticize her. Because I love the museum so much, I'm going to criticize her. You know, I want to see us get to a place where instead of having $30 museum entrance fees, we have $5 museum entrance fees. I mean, what would happen then to the concept of membership in a museum if people could get in the door a little easier, you know? And it's not just about, oh, we have a community day and let people in for free, or we do a certain amount of things with school kids. But like, you know, to the point of subversive, yes. how can we rethink yes. membership in yes. the museum context to broaden the inclusion? Well, one way is to make it, you know, to, to lower the, to, otherwise it becomes elitist and right. exclusive, right? Right, right, right? and that's and that, not what we no. want. And, that, no. and that's, not, that's not embracing the community when you're elit elitist and uh, exclusive. No, and it's, you know, and it's too much because we see when there's, you know, I mean, of course it's the pandemic now, but when there are community days at museums, the line is around the block. That yes. could be telling everybody something, yes. you know? I mean, and it, I, this is not just in San Francisco. I mean, I remember being around the block in New York City because those museums, good gosh, $35 to roll in Met, you know, $35 to roll in Guggenheim. Right. You know? so, so, you know, there, so, yeah, please. So, mm -hmm. so if, they're, if, they're, if, the, if the fees are high to enter, then who is the community they're serving? Right. Right. 
we need to broaden, broaden the community at every turn, you know? Yeah. And so I think that if anything, you know, I kind of call them pandemic pluses. I think one of the great pandemic pluses is opportunities like this, you know, to the extent that things are available on Zoom free or at yes. very low price points is opening it up for people to have more access to programming than ever before. With the caveat, let me just say the caveat, provided that people have the computer, that they have the Wi-Fi you know, in place to make that happen. But to the extent that a lot of technologies now work on the mobile phone, that's given more people access as well that otherwise wouldn't have had access. You know, you know, here's a, here's a, uh, well, I have a, we all have crazy ideas, but here's one. So how about the idea of like, you know, redefining what a museum is, you know? So, so saying that, you know, um, it's a, it's a neighborhood and everyone in there, everyone in that neighborhood, you go from one room, one home to the next when we're able to do this. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, there's an art show in someone's home. And right. it's the museum of the community where artists, either, either in their home or their gallery, mm -hmm. either in their home or their studio, have people go to there and see the work, you know, not in a rarefied off somewhere else space, mm -hmm. but, you know, in the community. You yeah. know, so say for example, like there's 10 people or five people who wanna like, you know, I'm gonna open up my house you know, or, or or another venue that people can bring their work to, you know, it's gonna be, you know, but the idea of redefining what a museum is, because if we all, you know, it's like, you know, you know, me and my house. So if, if you know, like, how do I want, how do, what do I want in, in my house, you know, right. as opposed to like going to somebody else's house under their rules, yeah. under their criteria, you know, that, that, that may be very different than what the, a neighborhood or other people who've been who've been traditionally excluded don't feel welcome. Like I remember my uh, restore. My mother came to visit. she been she's been there many times, mm -hmm. and I was able to get tickets to go to SF MoMA. And so we went there, mm -hmm. and then she came back a few years later. And I said, you know, well, Mom, I have I have tickets to SF MoMA, mm -hmm. and we can go to the museum. And she said, mm, there's nothing there for me. Mm -hmm. And I've never, and I, you know, I'm in the museum world. Right, <laughs> and my right. mother says, uh, "No, let's go. To, let's go. Let's go over here." And I'm thinking, yeah. so something in there didn't reflect her experience. Right, right, right. You know, so yeah. that that get, that woke me up to like, well, am I, am I re reflecting my experience as an artist, or am I re reflecting somebody else's experience? So where's my authenticity? Mm -hmm. Well, see, I also think you're speaking to why there is still a need for Black institutions, why there's still a need for women's institutions, why there's still a need for every possible combination of people to have also their own space. You know, I think of like the role the Studio Museum in Harlem has played. Oh, to absolutely. Yeah, to elevate Black art. You know, so there has to be a combination of a mainstream space that's a majority white space, but then there also still needs to be a place that is a black space that, you know, is directed by black people, has black people on the board, all the things, you know, because we're not at the place yet. And this gets back to your point about hope. We're not there yet in terms of that full, free, and just society we want. So we need to hold both institutions in high regard and make sure they have what they need to be successful. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, yes. Yes. Um, it's a lot of work. Yes, yes, it is. But you know, I mean, we're up for it, okay? We up for it, Ramakon. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are. And we're still there. We're still doing it. You no, know? it's still, you know, we're still up for it. You know, I mean, it's great. I mean, and and also, I think, you know, to your point, I think about all the artists that, you know, 
participate in open studio, for example. I mean, that's a way for people to have direct access to the artist beyond the gallery setting, beyond the museum setting, you know, and there's certainly like people who open their homes because that's where their studio is, you know, at that time. And so I do agree that it's really important for people to be able to like get close to the artist, get close to the place, you know, aside from these larger venues. Yes. You know, so, you know, you know, that, you know, the idea that does, does my art matter if it isn't in a venue, mm -hmm. right? So, and I, I say yes, because I was, you know, and we both have been making work that, you know, that didn't make it to the music, that didn't make it to the oh, venue. Yeah. yeah. And we That's still right. made the work. I mean, I really like the, uh, what's it called? The vernacular, uh, African-American vernacular art. Mm -hmm. where you know there's a folk art tradition and they're making art out of anything they put their hands on yeah I mean, it could be yes. a, like it could be a uh, from a tire you know or, or a rock or a tree or whatever mm -hmm. and and i and i find great um inspiration i'm talking great inspiration from souls grown deep mm -hmm. and the, the book of the book that the two volume book about african-american uh, vernacular artists who mm -hmm. weren't worried about showing their work anywhere other than in the in the yard or in their house, yeah. And so they're so liberated. I don't, I, they don't. They're not worrying about the audience. So mm -hmm. they're just cultivating, and I really like that. The cultivating your vision and yeah. not be um, burdened by you know the uh, art historical perspective, right? Or what, right? Or what the neighbors are going to think, or what your mama's going to think about you know if you you know if you do this. You know, it's this constant, but the um, not worrying about what it's gonna where it's gonna go just be liberated enough to liberate liberate the materials and yourself yeah no and i mean that's the end game i think that's always the end game is liberation you know in any form i mean whether you had a place to show art or not i believe you would make sculpture you know and i mean i certainly make things whether I have a place to show them or not. And I got to say that nine times out of 10, the last thing, I mean, usually after I've made work, then I go, hmm, I doubt anybody, it's going to take a special person to buy that. You know, it, I mean, that's not going to, that didn't stop me from making the work. You know, right. I never say I'm making this work because I want this work to sell. It's like, I'm making this work because I'm interested in the topic or there's been a curatorial vision presented yes. to me for a show and I wanna make work for that. And like, you know, the cherry on the Sunday is if somebody buys it, that's yes. wonderful. Yes, mm -hmm. you know, I agree with that. Someone, that's right, if someone buys it, yes. I mean, it's not, it's not you know, cause it's, it's, too, it's too much to risk um, you know, worrying about if it's going to sell, because you're not able you're not able to be freed up to uh, have a vision or to cultivate your vision if it's only ha if it's if your only focus is well, what is it what is it what meaning does it have if it doesn't have a monetary meaning? Right. But I think as a personal like I don't I would not be who I am if it wasn't for my creativity. I I it, you know I wouldn't be who I am. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I agree. I know I wouldn't be who I am. There's no way, you know. There's no way. No, because no. I mean, and I think you shared it too from your childhood. You know, my family knew I was an artist. They didn't like it in the beginning, you know, because I came from a nice working class Black family with a single mother that really wanted a lawyer or a doctor. But, you know, over time, once you understood, well, I got an artist and by the way, you know, me and your father was musicians. Hello. You know, it's like, you see that it's going to be okay. But I, you know, it was rooted in whatever the vision of financial security was supposed to be out of a certain professional stream, you know, Yes, but they're, they're, they didn't know, they didn't know any artists who had been able to uh, survive, not, not much, much less thrive. No. So that so they were frightened to think. Well, we don't know how to protect. It's one thing to raise black children, right? 
There's another thing they're being able to, and, and if they're like, you know, black and gay or black and lesbian, or whatever the other is, it's, but another, it's, you know, which it also throws them off because they don't know, they don't, because they, they never, they don't know how to navigate that. And then mm-hmm. on top of that, you're an artist. Right. So we don't know how to, so they're, they're not, they want to be able to say, how can we help you? But we don't know how, because you're moving in an area that is unfamiliar to us on so many levels. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's what, you know. Um, right. And then my father, my father said, you know what? Just, you know, you want to go to Japan? Get, well, get a ticket and go. Then what else can I, I mean, <laughs> well, I can't tell you what it's like to be in Japan because I haven't been there, but if you want to go, you know, go. go. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, no. And I mean, ultimately, you know, it was the same thing. I mean, my mother was like, okay, I thought we got rid of this art thing years ago on the musical side, but it's back with the visual art. So I got to let it go, you know, and we made peace with it. So it was all good. But so we're going to turn to, I know we're going to got some questions coming in from YouTube. So we'll do a speed round with these final questions. All right. So I know we both value meditation. Are there yes. any other vital practices? Do you want to talk about meditation and any other vital practices that sustain your creativity? Um, I, I usually keep a dream journal. Mm-hmm. I write my dreams down and I have a, you know, an on and off currently book of affirmations. Mm, nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I try to have a very structured morning you know, um, that involves like some meditation, some journaling, you know, not jumping on the phone at all right away to deal with the emails or the yeah. slacks or any of that, you know, but really kind of be structured and, you know, mantra is important to me, how I like get into my day. Um, it is Mardi Gras. Mm-hmm. Have you been to New Orleans for Mardi Gras or any place else? I've only been to I've been to New Orleans only to hear uh, with I went with friends to hear Lenny Kravitz. Ooh, wow. <laughs> so, okay, <laughs> I've seen Lenny. That was yeah, that, ooh, that, that, that was, was hot. Okay, that, and it was really hot. It was really hot that summer. Yes, really. Okay, that is very cool. Yeah, I've been a few times and as I'm going at some point, if all goes well this fall for um, a residency that was delayed, Um, but I did make a mocktail. So when we take questions, I have a mocktail in this beautiful, (laughs) it's a whiskey sipper that uh, actually, you know, this person, the great maker, Jerry Kung. Yes. Yes, Jerry did this beautiful mold blown Beautiful. And they're only available, I think they're in shops in LA and uh, Tokyo, to your point. But I made a little mocktail for tonight in my beautiful glass. Um, And then I think the last question, did we get through all the questions? Oh, where can people see more of your work? You have a talk coming up, UC Davis, yes? UC Davis, Uh, that's on, um, I think that's the 4th, March 4th. Right, okay, and then, great. great, and in the the gallery, the, you know, you can uh, arrange, you can arrange to meet there. Oh, at, good. Uh, Patricia Sweeto Gallery, you know, it's probably the best place to see the you know the work, the current work there. Okay, great, 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 and then uh, this Friday, I am doing an Instagram live with Savoir Fair. Uh, some of you may know the wonderful art supply company Savoir Fair. So we're doing a little chat um, and that is going to be at 2 p.m. Fantastic. So, yeah. Remicon, thank you so much for doing this. This has been so much fun. I agree. Thank you. Yes. And let's open it up for questions. Anissa, Thanks. you have questions for us? Let me see if I see. Oh, yeah. hi, Ramakan. I'm here. I'm going to be just voice. Okay. So I do have a couple from our YouTube viewers, which we have quite a few out there. Hi, so thank YouTube. You. I know. Hi, YouTube. Um, Ramakan, how do you get the recycling? How did you get the recycling fellowship? And what surprised you most with that body of work? Mm-hmm. Uh, thank you for that question. The, I, I applied for the recology uh, residency, I think two or three times. 
before I before I got it, you know. So I so I applied and I finally and I finally was successful. And what was what was great about the the experience is that there, you know, the staff is wonderful, the and the access to the materials, mm -hmm. you know, and the materials aren't the materials that come from the dipsy dumpsters. They're the materials that people pay to have recycled. So it's a range of everything, everything that everything, even things that have never been opened and have their labels on it. And it's overwhelming to see how much stuff is there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and being able to look at objects, you know, we, we put so much value and power in objects. Mm. But we don't remember that the objects have no power. We give objects power and meaning, mm -hmm. right? You know, you know, you know, for example, the, the, the flag, we, it has meaning because we give it, but, but in and of itself, it's, it's, um, it's uh, red, red ink or dye, red, white, and blue on cloth. In and of itself, it's just an object. Mm -hmm. But while I was there, I learned that how, how we can uh, transform uh, everyday objects to have powerful meaning. It would, it, and and I, don't think, I don't think that I would be where I am now with the idea of ceramics and fabric if it wasn't for my experience at Recology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. All right, and one for Cheryl from YouTube. Can you talk about your piece that was bought by the DeYoung mm -hmm. and the response to it and what inspired you to create it? Sure. Um, so the piece, 2017 Year at a Glance, 214 Dead Black Men had a really good reception. Um, a lot of people you know, reached out to me through my social media about it. Um, the piece was featured in a couple of articles about the De Young show. And so that also, you know, brought the dialogue to a bigger audience. It was written up in the San Francisco Chronicle and also in the Guardian US edition. Um, I think the thing that inspired me most to make the piece and continues to inspire me to work with the data set around police brutality is that we don't really understand the magnitude of the problem. We can all say whatever names we have heard over and over again in the press and it becomes just dreadful. It's a dreadful list. You know, when I start thinking about the names, um, it just, you know, it breaks my heart. It's like George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and Tamir Rice. And, you know, it just goes on and on with these names, you know, and, and I can go farther and say, Amadou Diallo, you know, Eleanor Bumpers, Michael Stewart, you know, cause I was a kid of the 1980s in New York city. I mean, it just, the, this legacy of police brutality and, you know, not just black people being killed by the police but who are disproportionately killed by the police, but the amount of people killed by the police, we have a problem with policing. And so I am inspired, you know, to make the work and continue to show the work um, in ways that help viewers understand it's not just the five names we heard in the news in 2020, it's really you know, 214 black men in one year that were part of 1000 people who were killed by the police in that same year. So helping us as a society grapple with the magnitude of the problem and move to the place of defunding the police and investing in the types of community services that are desperately needed. We don't need police handling mental health challenges. We don't need police handling domestic violence challenges. We need trained professionals. We don't need police with military weapons. Thank you, Cheryl. That is a true story. Um, Cheryl, can you talk about uh, the, how your images, where you find your images or how they find you? Uh, so a lot of my images are either historical images that I source through public domain collections at libraries, 
or my own photographs. So like the billboard I showed that's up now, that's my own photograph of Richmond. Um, the images on my website of former slaves were actually sourced from the digital collection of New York Public Library. Um, you know, I always say one day, I don't know when, but I am going to have a show at the British Library one day because I've worked a lot with historical images from their digital collection. So public domain images, I really enjoy putting historical images into contemporary dialogues again. So we see not new, not special, been dealing with a lot of the same issues for a long time. Yes, you can always find inspiration at the library. Um, Ramakan, can you talk about Crochet Jam a little more and what inspired you to start that and of any other projects you work with um, in community base? Mm -hmm. um, well, thank you for that question. You know, um, Crochet Jam started around nine, nine years ago, but before that it was, um, it was called uh, Stitch where I invite my friends to come over to my, to my place here and we would just uh, sew rag rugs mm. together. Sew rag rugs together. And I did that for like maybe two years. So it's so crochet jam is, will be 10 years in August, mm -hmm. um, you know, in person and, and virtually. And before that, it was two years before that, it was stitch. So how did it change from stitch to crochet jam was at the de young when the de young had the artist residency programs there which was you know was a fabulous program um, yeah. mm -hmm. you know and uh renee balbachi uh did a fantastic job there with that mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so i applied for the residency there and you know renee loved the idea but she also she also made it made it made me aware of the fact that um, sewing required needles mm. and sewing needles may have to be, you know, we don't want to have to like teach little kids how to clean needles mm -hmm. because, you know, anything that would draw and um, draw blood and would prick and draw blood was a, was not a good idea. So I, so, and then I, I mentioned it to one of my, my colleagues at, 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 uh, at SFO museum where I, where I used to work. And she said, well, if you're, if you're sewing rag rug, you also can crochet rag rugs. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so, so she showed me how to crochet. And then that's how, that's how it moved. And then I was able to, because um, I, I didn't, I didn't want to teach people how to clean needles. I didn't want to use sewing needles in, in, you know, in a public space. So, so, you know, these transitions, you know, first it was at the De Young with, you know, with the, the arts program there. And then later it, it, it was another transition when I, when I graduated from my day job uh, mm -hmm. at, at Recology. So, but the whole idea, you know, of, of uh, you know, my, my, my grandmother allowed me to, to break the pattern of her quilt making. So she had a quilt. Mm -hmm. I was struggling with the idea of being queer and black and uh, growing up in the Jim Crow South in the sixties and seventies, you know, late sixties. Um, and she just said, you know, come here and help me with this quilt. And I thought, you know, the last thing I want to be doing as adolescent male is sewing with my grandmother. <laughs> and also the whole idea of a black power movement and this whole, you know, over the top male masculinity was, mm -hmm. was you know, was, um, was oppressive in many ways, you know, and offensive, you know, in many ways, because, you know, the whole idea of, of having enough, being powerful, you know, to confront the white power structure. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, and being black and being, being queer and uh, homosexual kind of like threw a whole, whole, whole nother, mm -hmm. you know, problem into that, you know, and my grandmother just said, I'll, I'll show you, you know, any color, any pattern you want, I'll show you how to add it to my quilt. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't like you're going to follow this pattern, do as I say, you know, these are the colors, I'll show you how to add it. Nice. So that whole idea of, of, of being a, a, embracing uh, breaking the rules had its roots with my grandmother, who was being subversive. I mean, the pattern already had a the quilt already had a pattern. Mm -hmm. So I so so when I stopped worrying about trying to be an artist in a traditional standpoint, you know, of mm -hmm. working in paint or whatever, and started well, what, let 
let this be my art as a social practice and give to others what my grandmother gave to me, mm-hmm. you know, where you, where you're embraced, you're, you're accepted. It, it's a safe environment and you're able to, now you're not being judged. Mm-hmm. That's how it, that's, the, you know, that's. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Ramakan. That was wonderful. And I, I, we can open it up to anyone uh, that wants to unmute and ask a question, but I don't see any more questions happening. Um, and that is our time, but we, we definitely don't cut people off here. So if anyone wanted to unmute and ask a question, we can make that happen. YouTube friends, we thank you for your interesting question. Oh, you know what? I did have a question, Ramakan. Um, you mentioned David Johnson. Is he the same David Johnson from Harlem of the West photographs? Yes. Okay, I want to make sure I got that in the um, links correctly. And he's going to run and go get a photograph. So I love I was that. I say, Ramakot is on the move. <laughs> don't leave. Um, this is good. Don't leave. And the photos are Ooh. just uh, a little high yet gorgeous. Beautiful. So you can check out Harlem of the West Be from demand. the library. Beautiful book. Uh, or we, we also had a presentation. So you can check that out. And I put it in the links with all of the links to tonight's talk. Or maybe, hopefully all. Sometimes they get talking and I can't keep up. But. I think I got everybody and all the links to the artist tonight. We thank you so much for your time. And you know, I want to think this is a community. So library uh, community, we miss you. We love you. Happy Mardi Gras. Come back next week. Come back tomorrow night. Same place. Same, not the same time, 6 p.m. <laughs> Ramakan, Cheryl, thank you so much. We appreciate the love you've given to the library thank community you. tonight. And I thank will you, see Cheryl. you both soon. And what, sorry, not letting you go yet. Rodney <laughs> Ewing, who uh, yeah. is our artist spotlight for more than a month, will be in the virtual library next week. Please check out his artwork. It is beautiful. And he utilized a lot of stuff from the San Francisco's public library's archive. So check that out. And now, yes, unmute, unhide. Let's give it up, everybody. Yay. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. This is awesome. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Right. So glad you came. Happy Mardi Gras every day, everybody. I got my mocktail too. Okay, good. Mocktail. <laughs> Cheers. Happy Mardi Gras. Cheers. Cheers.